Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 305, Sexual Rhythms in Relationships. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. In the work that we do, we each have our own focus. I am a licensed therapist. I've been in private practice for over 30 years. Kathy is a physician who's been in private practice 10 or 15 years. 30. 30 years. years. Okay. I didn't want to say that. Um, and a lot of what we talk about with people has to do with sex, sexual behaviors, uh, what's normal, uh, performance concerns or issues on either side of the spectrum, uh, and intimacy. And so we thought we'd spend some time today talking about sexual relationships, problems that occur, questions of intimacy, uh, and things that we can contribute from both fields of thought, uh, wherever we can find overlaps to say, well, there's, there's a mechanical, physiological issue here, like a low libido or a dry vagina that's uh, treatable, solvable, and that may be the end of it. Uh, low testosterone is an issue that we now know is a mechanical, physiological issue that impacts your sex drive, your desire for your partner, your ability to function with your partner. We know things like antidepressants or beta blockers that you take for one reason or another for medical conditions also then inhibit your sexual performance, your level of desire, Mm -hmm. your functionality. Uh, and, And then we know about relationships and we know about attraction and communication and signaling and cueing uh, and the evolution, at least in the male, Mm -hmm. from the younger guy who is predominantly orgasmically focused. How many times can I get there? How many times, how many women can I have? How many times can I have an orgasm to an older guy who hopefully has outgrown that and is more focused (laughs) on the issue of intimacy with his partner and, and sex as you age becomes less about the big explosive payoff at the end and more about the quality of the encounter in its duration. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about some of those ingredients, some of those elements. We're going to start with a discussion on which we each have a perspective uh, about what attracts us to somebody. What, what makes you turn your head and go, oh, wow, make your heart beat a little faster and make you think, mm, I'd like to be with that person in a physiological <laughs> like, way. Perfect man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. So is that just a physical thing? Is that a cultural thing? Is it a combination of the two? Is it hardwired? Yeah. And and historically, what, what can we know? And Kathy has an interesting perspective for me about this, uh, in terms of historical data, archeologic, uh, anthropological, anthropologic, uh, about what women look for in men and what, you know, when they are given the choice, when they're not in male dominated societies that just take them as markers. But if a woman has the ability, the option to choose or maneuver, manipulate toward the guy that she wants, what is she looking for? So I think, and we've talked about this, but I think there's two, two um, times in our lives that we're looking for a particular type of person in a man. I mean, we're looking for certain characteristics. And I think when we're young, unconsciously, unconsciously, unconsciously hardwired, basically it it takes us down to the monkey brain level of our, of our brain. And we don't know why this is, but, but in retrospect, this has been studied by um, many anthropologists. That's right. I misspoke. And that has been delineated that women are attracted in their fertile years to the perfect sperm donor, the perfect genetic person, the perfect genetic partner. Right. So how, how does she so, recognize that? So what, what keys? So so the keys are the strongest guy in the pack is the guy with the best testosterone and the best growth hormone. That means he's tall and he has a, a good musculature. 
So that is the first thing. You see the tall, dark, and handsome thing? Darker you are, usually, not always, gives you a higher testosterone level. And so, we've studied So those of this. us that are nerds have to find a compensatory strategy. Well, you used to be dark and you're tall, so I think you're okay. <laughs> so we're talking about in our in our fertile I'm years. Still a nerd. We're looking yeah. for yeah, well, you're not really. Anyway, so we're looking for a certain thing. We're also looking for intelligence because in this world, intellect right. is is a strong sign of a good provider. So in the back of our monkey brain, we're looking for the best genetics, the the most symmetrical face, that that means health the best skin, meaning no lesions or no acne, because even though acne can mean high testosterone, acne can mean not healthy. So in our brain, so we're looking for... So subconsciously, we assimilate all that data. A clear, yeah, a clear uh, complexion. We're looking for good muscles. We're looking for somebody who walks with confidence. You know, somebody who walks with confidence is going gonna, is gonna to protect our family. Now, this is in the... In the the monkey brain did, didn't come in and say, well, now we have women's lib and women make their own money. Right. And now we have, now women have an equal kind of, but never quite equal opportunity to progress in society. Our monkey brain doesn't see that. That's why we're so different when we're 20 than when we're 50, because that part of our brain is running everything. Mm. And, and if you, if you've been married twice and you look at who was the mother or who was the father of your children and who you now want to be with, sometimes that's not the same kind of person. Right, right. Because you pick the genetic donor, but not necessarily the person who was most like you and the most who or the are the most compatible with you. And now you're looking at who's the most compatible with you because you don't need a sperm donor anymore. And that's what happens as we as we age. So you don't want to be swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool. Right. You won't, okay. So and that's you know, so if you look at a bar, you watch the the women and the men that hook up. I mean, basically yeah. it's tall, dark and handsome. And, and on the women's side, it's breasts, hips, waistline. That's, you know, that's the most attractive, beautiful mm. hair, shiny hair. That's health, Healthy. beautiful complexion. That's health. Usually it doesn't mean we don't look, men don't look for the same things. They don't look for like the tallest woman in the room. Usually it's a medium height or someone less tall than they are. And they look for feminine qualities in the face because that means lots of estrogen and lots of eggs. Seriously, so, this is how base it is. It's almost like breeding well, dogs. Well, there's actually a book <laughs> that was written by a Harvard sociobiologist. It's called Sociobiology. His name is Edward Wilson, in which he argues that the breeding strategies of the sexes are different and that they are genetically determined and driven. Um, he says that men are all about propagating, dispersing their sperm as widely as they can so that their offspring are the more numerous within the community. And women are about nesting. Mm -hmm. And that that has to do with the fact that women go through estrus on a monthly basis, not permanently, not every day, not always. So you have to stay around. You have to make sure that you're there when she's fertile and not some other guy. And if she gets pregnant, then you have to stay there to protect your investment and in the lasts system. And that 18 months. There's a time period. Yeah. 18 months is what it takes to get a woman pregnant and to stay with them during a gestation and to make sure they're okay and then psh, gone. And how many relationships are like that? So many. <laughs> well, and, but for... But that's neurotransmitters. The balancing you of the argument way. psychologically then, though, is that if he... If he's assured that that's his child, then he has an investment in protecting that child and staying around and raising that child. Mm -hmm. And then there are cultural arguments about different elements of society that don't do that. They just have a lot of children and mm -hmm. move on. And the guys are not present. They're mm -hmm. not there. Uh, but but, that, but that's the, the attraction piece that we're talking right. about mm -hmm. initially has to do with those strategies, according to Edward Wilson. And uh, according to... Cindy Meeston and the other people that I've read mm -hmm. who who are describing their research, in, huge research in how men and women get together and why. Mm -hmm. But the but the one of the uh, interesting things in how um, women look to men, they they are attracted to men for eighteen months. There's yeah. this there's this oxytocin that that is produced and it's a hormone and it makes you 
hot for this one person for 18 months, and then you slide into this comfortable stage, well, just and everybody goes, the thrill is gone. I've, well, I've been yeah, with my I wife guess. for 31 years, yes. so that first 18 months, I'm pretty safe. After that, I have to find other reasons to make her want to be with me. Mm-hmm. Beyond, no, 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 no. You have to find. Brand. You have. Yeah, you have to find other reasons. We both have to find. You both do. We'd, okay. Have to to be together. Something yeah. that holds you besides yes. maybe a child. A child might hold you. It but, might, but and uh, it does in many. The divorce couples. rate's almost fifty percent. So the child obviously doesn't hold. Right. As, as that's right. But you know the other thing that's really interesting, which you might want to take away from this, is that babies look like their fathers for one year, and that. Is is a something that I can't explain except maybe that God's brilliant. So that you look at your baby and you say, "That's mine. Mm-hmm. That's my baby. Yeah. Looks just like my baby pictures. That baby, you know, and the baby may turn out to look just like her mother or his mother. But or in that mailman. first, well, that's true. See, <laughs> so so that first year they look just like dad. So just so use that <laughs> piece of information. To, 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 Put a period to this conversation, this piece of the conversation about what attracts us one way or the other. Uh, It's not a quotation from Edward uh, Wilson or from anyone else I know of. It's just a thing that's said in the community. That is that women need a reason to have sex. Men just need a place. Oh, it's possible. And that works until it has to do with the breeding strategies as Mm -hmm. far as the attraction. Mm -hmm. So then so then we talk about sex drives. You feel the libido, you feel the sex drive. Once you go through puberty, man, all those systems fire up and you start thinking about sex, you start wanting to have sex, you start looking for opportunities to have sex, and you start filtering among your options with whom you would prefer to have sex. So let's talk about some of the, the elements of libido like testosterone. And we we talk about this a lot, but testosterone is the is the chemical drive to have sex. And seriously, without it, it's not estrogen. It's testosterone in both sexes. So for us to have, for women and men to have sex, Mm -hmm. it requires a certain level and everybody's got a different level that's required that is bathing your brain to want to have sex. A level of the chemicals in your brain. Yes. uh, The testosterone stimulates the neurotransmitters that make you want to have sex. It also stimulates the part of the brain that wants to have sex. Okay. So basically... It is necessary to have testosterone for you to actually desire or initiate sex. So it's the, more than just the procreative urge. It's more than just I want to, to replicate myself so that right. there's proof that I was here. No, it's just it's it's the ur- it's the urge to well you seek may be release. yeah to seek release or to mm-hmm. to be bonded or to be or just to enjoy sex. Okay. I mean that is one of the that's one thing that Americans get wrong. Right. The rest of the world doesn't is that sex is really good for you and we make it such a bad dirty thing that no one can even talk about it in my office without going, "Well, you, you know, I, I'm I'm nervous about talking about this." Well, you shouldn't be nervous about talking about it cuz that's what we're talking about. <laughs> so, it's it should be easy, but we make it very difficult and very we're very Puritanical. Puritanical. That's it. Puritanical is a good word. And and that's more of an indictment of American culture. That is not a universal. There are other cultures, uh, French, who approach teaching their children about sexuality and exposing them to sexuality differently. Uh, and it's really a fascinating thing to, to study. But we're in America. We have our cultural systems. Sex is one of the most marketed things in America. Not direct, but uh, covert, indirect. Uh, car sales. I mean, you ever look at a car ad? It's all about sex. I mean, it's about presenting yourself as the well, most cars, masculine, powerful cars guy. Cars look like, I mean, like a Porsche looks like the back end of a woman. I mean, that's how you sell cars. You mm-hmm. make them look sexy. Like something you want to use. You want to drive. Yeah. <laughs> something you want to drive. That's, you know, so that's, I mean, it's it's one of those things that is is unconscious. So Except you find a partner. Well, however you got to that place, you find a partner, mm-hmm. and, and then you're free to be sexual with one another. And then you find that there's a dance within the freedom of that sexuality in terms of signaling, cueing, communicating, satisfying two disparate levels of desire. Uh, how intimacy forms in a relationship <laughs> has a lot to do with the ability of the two people 
to without hurting each other's feelings, without causing any distress or disdain or what have you, let each other know what their rhythms are, what they like, what they don't like. I've spent a lot of time talking to couples about how openly can you talk about this? Can you talk about your fantasies? Can you ask for what you want specifically, verbally? Uh, and that's you, tough. You I run mean, most into find that difficult. complexities having to do with the level of stress, the level of exhaustion. Uh, does somebody smell bad? Does, is their breath bad? You know, uh, is your wife able to say to you, you know, when you go to bed and you're feeling amorous, uh, honey, do you mind brushing your teeth be before we start this? <laughs> and does that hurt your feelings? Mm -hmm. And do you then lose your interest? And mm -hmm. do you then say, well, you didn't want to have sex with me anyway? Mm -hmm. And you, and you damage in, in mm -hmm. my field, counseling field, has to do with what we call assumptive communications. You, yeah, when couples get to a place where They've been together enough, they've talked enough, they, quote, know each other and how each other thinks enough that they start to just assume what their partner is thinking, what their partner means, what their partner will say, and they have imaginary conversations. And In their own head. Right, in their own head. They never say anything outside their own head. But then they, you know, like on the way home, I'm thinking, oh, today's a good day and I'm feeling a little perky and I'm going to do this <laughs> and that. And, and, but nothing is said, but, so but how is, is she supposed this to is, know? Thursday and on Thursday my wife does this and she does that and so she's going to be late and when she comes home she's going to want me to fix the dinner and I'm tired and maybe I'll buy a carry in and she won't like that and so then I'll say this and she'll say so by the time you get home you had a steam worked up she walks in the door and says hi honey I'm home and you go oh yeah you know that <laughs> is not good cueing and that doesn't satisfy those issues and so there are problems in communication, in cueing, in understanding and interpreting. Uh, interpreting. The, the, there's an old rubric in nonverbal communications that says that seven, uh, in any direct person-to-person -person communication, I say something to you, mm -hmm. you hear and understand what I said, you respond to that, I hear and understand what you said, mm -hmm. that in any direct communication, only 7% of the message that's transmitted and received is made from the words that you use. That's shocking. Only 7%. You're only listening to 7%. Of you know, I can say, uh, <laughs> yes, dear, to mean, oh, that would be delightful. I would really like it. And I can say, yes, dear, in a way that communicates, same words, that communicates, go straight to hell. That's not Or in a context. Yeah, exactly. So 7% so are the words. 38% are the tone of voice, the modulation, the delivery, the mechanics of the sound that you make. And then 55% is facial expressions and body and they watch the face they watch the eyes uh and and they watch the rest of the body and when i was learning about reading nonverbal uh, communications one of the things that i learned is people try to control their face because they know people are watching try to control their eyes mm -hmm. and that when you get somebody that gets a rigid expression on their face that they're trying not to change watch the rest of their body watch their breathing watch their hands watch their feet uh, especially their breathing and then you but you have to understand that what you learn about uh, nonverbal communications is not individually predictive. So then you got to ask. What does that you mean? You know, I see your leg going. What is that telling me? What does that mean? Because I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to make an interpretation. Mm -hmm. But I need to ask. I need to mm -hmm. clarify. So then we talk to people about signaling and cueing for sexual desire, sexual performance, sexual behaviors, one kind or another. But they don't know what that means, so define. They, they are so resistant to having those conversations, to coming in and saying, they don't know what signaling and cueing means. Signaling, cueing. Uh, some people use humor. They make a joke about something sexual. They make a, a remark about somebody or something or look at this magazine ad. And in their minds, they're thinking, I'm letting you know I'm interested. And if you choose to overlook that, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to believe you chose to overlook it. Because I have very clearly said, well, she's hot. and <laughs> uh, Or that looks interesting. Yeah. And... So I get ahead of steam. I do the assumptive communication. So we have to teach people when that's happening as a part of their relationship that they need to say, you know, like there's a book called The Love Languages. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different love language. Uh, that you is say words, words, um, physical touch, presence, mm -hmm. either given or, or received. Um, who, who, now I'm going to, I've, there's two the, more. There's yeah. Two more. yeah. Um, because I'm remembering my oh quality time, and oh and service. Service. 
So, so I found out that my husband and I both have like completely different love languages. I, I, that often happens. Yeah. So completely I do different. something that to me very clearly says, oh, I love you. And to you, it's like, you know, so you wash the dishes. You know, what's the big deal there? And I'm like, well, I'm not a dish person. I clean the toilet. I'm not a toilet person. And <laughs> so you job. should you should come in and say, oh, my God, you clean the toilet. You want to make love? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen that way. So then I have to find are, out. They're speaking Russian and you're speaking Chinese. Exactly. I mean, it's So I have to find like, out what does I love you, I want you mean to my partner. And then I have to provide it, whether it means that to me or not. So if my partner says, you know what, the way you can really tell me that is bring me roses. I don't ever think about bringing roses. Mm -hmm. That means nothing to me. Roses are just, you cut a flower, it dies, and it sits there for a week and it smells nice. But that doesn't mean sex to me. Well, it may mean to her. And if it does, if I want to get lucky, then I'm going to have to bring her roses. <laughs> it's that simple. But teaching people the process of that of kind of communication. Of learning that and yes. then figuring out. I mean, you may, and you can't tell them to learn your love language, no. really. No, you have to learn theirs. You have to learn theirs. Because exactly. It is, it, you can only change yourself. Well, so that, you the can service, look at you know, you can do this for me as a gift of, you know, mm -hmm. I don't like chick flicks, but I'll go with you and, and I'll, I'll go service. clean. I'll go nice. I'll be pleasant. <laughs> I won't go and have an attitude and be pouty and say, oh, this sucks. You know, that's stupid. That's why I watch Hitler films with my husband. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, because he's really into he history and he likes it. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a potentially composed moment for the mm -hmm. two of you. So there's a, so there's a door that might those. open. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're sitting there being a, you know, a negative presence while he's watching a Hitler movie, that door's not going to open. It's going to close. It's true. It's true. But then there's some more overt things. Yes. I mean, like, yeah. and some of these things go away when you have children because you're like, oh, the children are going to see this. Oh, they're going to delay. Yeah. Or yeah. They, yeah, are they going right. to delay for a long time? And then yeah. you have to relearn them, right. which is like your husband comes up and puts his hand on your butt while you're washing the dishes and, right. and, and kisses your neck or, you know, yeah. whatever. Or, you know, he... Or you do that to him. Or I go, oh, would you like to come upstairs and brush my hair? Yeah. I mean, you know, something that overt yeah. is the key. And some people have that key, that phrase that makes their partner go, oh, we're on. I actually teach people cueing phrases that they would know that their kids wouldn't get. Yeah, uh, because because if you, you want to go upstairs and pay bills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you did the Yeah. Should we look over the books tonight, honey? Yeah. We have to do that alone. Yeah. Um, you know, you can you can have those things or you can have something very overt where a friend of mine had was one of seven children and her parents said, um, on Sunday, unless we are locking ourselves in our bedroom, we're going to be reading and we aren't coming out unless someone is going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So you all just take care of yourselves. Sunday's our day. And if you aren't before we come out, you're going when we come out. <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't. That, they wouldn't have said that because they were very polite. Yeah. But that well, sometimes would, you have but children direct sometimes messages Sometimes you too. have to actually yeah. say that and then plan it. And that gets around. The, the children kind of know what's going on, but they don't care, really. Because well, and there's one other element of communication that I think is, is relevant to this discussion. When you have physiological issues, when you start to age... When your blood pressure goes up, you have a heart condition, you're depressed, you're overstressed, that affects your libido and your performance capacities. And, and men in particular, when they start to get into that uh, mm -hmm. time range where they have erectile issues, erectile dysfunction, uh, they're not as firm, they're not as hard, they're not able to do anything uh, without some medicated assistance, they develop some real performance anxiety uh, that needs to be handle with kid gloves in terms of how you talk about it, how you communicate, how you understand. If I'm on an antidepressant, most of the antidepressants will lower my libido or, or kill it altogether. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I talk to couples that someone in, in the partnership is taking an antidepressant, we have that conversation. This is not about not loving you. This is not about not wanting you or not wanting to be sexual with you. Mm -hmm. This is about a, a chemical trigger that turns off their system. And so it can happen at any point in the process. And if it is happening, there needs to be a gentleness and an understanding mm -hmm. about it, not a hurt feelings. It doesn't mean he doesn't desire you, you aren't attractive, he doesn't want you, he doesn't love you. It means physiologically his system is broken. And so you need some uh, understanding for both of you to have about how to talk about that, how to communicate, how to love one another through it. And how not to be abusive about it because that just that's it. That'll kill it and yeah. you'll that'll make have 
years of therapy to get that back. So you just can't. Yeah, try not to do any damage. I see that. I see that in my office at because there are people are at the end of their rope. Because well, and it can happen working. with women too. If they're on well, yeah. antidepressants, it can happen if they have the dry vagina or if they have pain in some way. <clears throat> well, we we fix that. I yes, mean, well, we fix that by giving back do. hormones. But if someone's on uh, two to three antipsychotic, antidepressant, anti anxiety right, right, drugs, doesn't matter what they're Three of are. them will will just cancel out the testosterone part. I mean, they still won't have pain. When they're having intercourse because we'll fix the estrogen, but they really won't want to initiate and they may not, you know, they try after they get on the testosterone, which is successful in most of them, that they can decrease their dose, which helps. Well, and that gives on, them better, for, better libido. For women, if they're not on testosterone, they may go through a cycle where if they don't have their testosterone, they may go through a cycle where it just doesn't ever occur to them. It, it doesn't like it never registers on the radar. Right. And they and pe- women come in and say, "I used to be really sexual, and now I feel like I'm I have no sex at all. I'm not a man or a woman. I'm just nothing because I don't think about sex. I don't want sex. Men don't look attractive. I don't. I mean, my right. husband doesn't look attractive. I don't feel like right. doing anything. So that's a testosterone issue, and we we treat that pretty well. I mean, most of the time we're very successful with that. So, so the good news is we know a lot about this. We know a lot about the physiological components. The uh, Psychological, emotional components, the communication components. And I don't mean the two of us. I mean the community of (laughs) providers Mm -hmm. does. And so if you are struggling with some of these things, instead of getting angry or instead of getting ashamed, go get some help. Go get Mm -hmm. some physical help. Have a good physical checkup. Go get some psychological help so that you can communicate better because the key to intimacy is communication. Thank you. Good luck. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.